photo so evil it was never meant to be seen by Mr. Boylan. Punctuations are important. Hey, what's good? How your day going? Your morning, your evening, your night. <sighs> your beautiful fall season. My breath don't stink. But either way it go though, I'm about to go ahead and check out this Mr. Boylan video and see what's going on with this photo. I can't help but to wonder if it's like a scary ghost story, but the photo looked pretty real to me. But regardless though, either way it go, you wanna check out the original video. The link will be in the description below, but let's go. Today, I'm going to share three progressively more unbelievable stories. And at the end of each of them, I will share the famous photo or photos that are associated with them. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please unpair all of the Bluetooth devices connected to the like button's phone. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's up. stories. Copyright. Man, I th thought it was gonna be just one dedicated story, but ooh, didn't know it was about to be three. Well, yo, boy, this match. Early on the afternoon of October 12, 1960, a 17-year-old high school student named Otoya Yamaguchi stood alone in his brother's house in the city of Tokyo, Japan, waiting for a tea kettle of water to boil. It was a Wednesday, so Otoya should have been at school, but that day he had gone to school and then snuck out a side door during lunch. More and more often these days, Otoya was feeling like school was kind of meaningless. It was hard for him to sit in history class and watch all of his classmates diligently take notes when, in Otoya's mind, he felt like all the real history was happening outside of the classroom. Just then, the kettle on the stove began to whistle, which meant the water was boiling, and so Otoya grabbed the kettle, he took it off the burner, and he poured it over a tea bag and a cup. And as Otoya began to stir his tea, he began to go over what he was going to do later that day. It was undeniable that Otoya had a very difficult afternoon in store. He had a meeting with a person who was very important, and during this meeting, Otoya would have to deliver some very bad news. In fact, this news was so bad that Otoya had decided what he was going to do was literally write down this bad news and hand deliver it. Now, Otoya had not quite Sounds figured out bad. news was so bad that Otoya had decided what he was going to do was literally write down this bad news and hand deliver it. Now, Otoya had not quite figured out what he was going to write, but he knew whatever it was, it would have to be perfect. For months now, Otoya had been trying to articulate this bad news that was really weighing heavily on him to his peers and to adults and to anybody who would listen, but nobody took Otoya seriously. Adults would look at Otoya and think, oh, that's just some kid. What he's talking about can't be serious. And when Otoya would talk to classmates, they would just kind of laugh at him. Otoya frowned and he looked out the window and he thought to himself, you know, maybe this whole time I've been coming off as too angry when I talk about this bad news. Maybe I need to change the way I talk about it to sound more sincere. And as Otoya was thinking about this, he suddenly thought, oh my goodness, I know exactly what to write. And so Otoya abandoned his tea and ran over to his brother's desk. He grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and he started writing. Over the last year, Otoya had felt like he had really grown up and really started to find his true self. He had been raised in a very strict household. His father was a colonel in the Japanese military, oh, and boy. he expected Otoya to be obedient and polite, and so that was what Otoya had done. But a couple of years earlier, Otoya had managed to secure a spot in a high school in Tokyo, far from where he had grown up, far from his father, and Otoya was really excited. He felt like going to this high school in Tokyo would finally allow him to kind of get out from under his dad's strict authoritarian rule. And his father had let him go to the high school in Tokyo, but after only a couple of weeks, it turned out Otoya's father had decided, nope, I don't want you to go there. And he had insisted that Otoya come back home and go to a Catholic school closer to their hometown. And it was at this point that Otoya, for the first time really in his whole life, he decided to push back against his dad. And so even though Otoya did come home, he did go to this Catholic school, as soon as he was home, he began constantly begging his dad to let him return to Tokyo, let him go back and live with his brother who lived in Tokyo, and let him go to the high school that he loved. And eventually, surprisingly, Otoya's father relented and said, okay, fine, you can go to Tokyo, you can do what you want. 
And so Otoya had been totally overjoyed. He had returned to Tokyo, gotten re-enrolled in the high school. But after only a couple of months, Otoya had kind of lost interest in the school. And instead, his focus had now shifted to politics. Otoya's brother, who Otoya lived with in Tokyo, was very into politics, and he was always taking Otoya to speeches and rallies, and very quickly, Otoya had gotten into it. And eventually, Otoya <sighs> began to think that his purpose in life was in politics, and he just didn't like the idea of having to wait until he graduated from high school to pursue that career ambition. But when Otoya brought these ambitions up to anyone... <sighs> I'm going to let it finish, but I don't know if it was just, hey, he was actually influenced just because it was that easy, the environment, my older brother I look up to, or was it just someone who was looking for a purpose anyway? Because we heard how he treated history class. I'm not going to lie to you. I understood that shit, though. It's like, yeah, I, I understand everyone trying to understand history, but selfishly, sorry, I'm trying to create my own history. But yeah, let me go back a bit. Basically, whatever's about to happen, it hey, sound like it's about to be easily influenced, though. I thought he was just about to break oh, up with a girl. He was very into politics, and he was always taking Otoya to speeches and rallies, and very quickly, Otoya had gotten into it. And eventually, Otoya began to think that his purpose in life was in politics. And he just didn't like the idea of having to wait until he graduated from high school to pursue that career ambition. But when Otoya brought these ambitions up to anyone who would listen, no one took him seriously. They looked at him as a skinny, scrawny, kind of meek little guy who was not going to make a difference in the world. But Otoya begged to differ. By now, Otoya was almost done with this note he was writing, and so he looked up and he checked the clock. He saw it was 2 p.m., which meant he really needed to get going soon. He was going to go to a political debate at the Habia Public Hall in downtown Tokyo, and the very important person he was going to meet and deliver this bad news to was going to be at this debate. Otoya took one more look down at the note he had just written, and he read it over a couple of times, and he realized he was missing one more line at the bottom. And so he leaned down and he wrote, quote, I can't forgive you. Feeling like he was done, he folded up the note, put it in his pocket, he stood up, he grabbed his school uniform jacket and put it on, and then he grabbed this package that he had got from his father's house and he put it under his arm, and then he headed out the front door. As parents no. Shit. He stood up, he grabbed his school uniform jacket and put it on, and then he grabbed this package that he had got from his father's house and he put it under his arm, and then he headed out the front door. Atoya always loved the walk downtown. The hall where this debate was going to take place was near the Imperial Palace, and it was this big, imposing building with a terracotta and stone facade that always inspired Otoya every time he saw it. When Otoya arrived at the hall, he saw loads of people streaming in through the front doors for this debate, and so Otoya joined them and made his way inside, and he moved towards the back of the auditorium, and then he began scanning the audience. And he saw there was at least 2,000 people inside, happily chatting and laughing and waiting for this thing to start. But all Otoya could think about was where this person was that he was going to be meeting, because as he was looking around, he didn't see them. At around 2.45 p.m., the moderator of this debate walked up onto the stage down in front, he went to the podium, he grabbed the mic, and he began telling the audience to take their seats and to be quiet, and then he began to explain the rules for this debate. Otoya, at this point, was really only half listening, because he was still looking all around the inside of this hall for this person he was going to meet. You know, where are they? They're not here. 15 minutes later, at around 3 p.m., the moderator left the podium and a new speaker came out on stage. He was a politician named Inijiro Asanuma, and he was the chairman of the Japan Socialist Party. But when he began to speak and all the thousands of people in attendance leaned in to listen, Otoya was totally not listening because he could now see the person he was going to meet had arrived. Careful not to cause a disturbance, Otoya moved from the back of the auditorium over to the side of the building and he began walking up a side aisle, only stopping briefly near a trash can where he pulled out that package he had brought from his father's house and he unwrapped it and he threw the wrapping away and held on to what was inside of the package. And then Otoya looked down at what he was holding, he took a deep breath and then he looked up and broke into a run. What happened next was broadcast live on television all across Japan. And by that evening, the footage had gone so viral that it was basically all over the world. A photographer who happened to be in the crowd of people watching this debate 
also happened to take a very iconic photo of what happened next involving Otoya, and that photo would actually go on to win the Pulitzer Prize in 1961. The Pulitzer Prize is a really big deal. It's the most prestigious award for journalism. It would turn out the very important person that Otoya was supposed to meet inside of this hall during this debate was in fact the speaker on stage at 3 p.m., Inajiro Asanuma, the chairman of the Japan Socialist Party. And the package that Otoya had brought from his father's house to this meeting was a samurai sword. And so after Otoya unwrapped the sword, he took a deep breath and then ran up on stage, Damn. charged to the podium, pulled back the sword and plunged it into Asanuma's torso before he could do anything. And the photographer out in the crowd who would win the Pulitzer happened to snap a photo right as Otoya was pulling the sword out of Asanuma and getting ready to stab him again. Onlookers would immediately out. rush the stage and tackle Otoya, but the damage was already done. Asanuma would pass away from his injuries within the hour. It would turn out Otoya, ever since moving to Tokyo, had become a radical right-wing ultranationalist. The note that Otoya had carefully penned and then folded up and put in his pocket before carrying out this assassination basically just said that Otoya did not hate Asanuma personally, but Asanuma was slowly transforming Japan into a communist country, and so Otoya could not forgive him for that and so Otoya decided he needed to act. Otoya was immediately arrested, but two weeks later, while he was in prison, he would take his own life. Man, duh, what There is the exactly... Hell? I can't tell if he was cock out over it was something wrong with the image, man. Hey, but people, you know what's wild, though? Because as I be digging into my political shit, as I watch what I watch, whatever, though, it always tripped me out when you do get the radical ones, though, who take it so far where it's like, yeah, you know what? I'm putting my life on the line to, to kill this person because I just don't like the way what they believe. And the crazy part is, shit's a good amount of the time. It'd be like years later, a lot of people believe change. But it'd be like two or three years later, some people should have changed. Like man, I ain't saying like full long haul gone because at that point you just tripping to me because you just all over the place. But you know what I mean? Though. Sometimes shit just be like, yeah, I don't look at it that way no more. I knew I wasn't mad at Pops. Pops knew what he was doing. Probably wasn't even that tough on the kid, though. Probably wasn't tough enough, if you ask me. But either way it go, though, man, this shit tripped me out because at one point I'm thinking he about to go break up with a girl. And I'm like, oh, is she about to become a school ooter? Come to find out it's politics. Like, yeah, we know where this is about to go. But to a radical man, it was like a damn anime picture to me, though. So while he was no in prison, on his he would face, take his dude. own life. I never there is exactly politics, one YouTube channel that I personally religiously follow. It's called Bedtime Camp Stories, Charlie. and it's like the most epic storytelling. And my goodness, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious, you will be a fan of Bedtime Stories. They cover strange, crazy stories as well, and it's just masterfully done. But I'm not here today just to tell you how great Bedtime Stories is. I'm here today because I have an announcement. Bedtime Stories is starting a podcast, and it's going to fall under the Ballin Studios banner. We're working together. It's super cool. But here's the even bigger news. Not only is Bedtime Stories a brand new Ballin Studios podcast, it is live right now. New episodes of hey, the Bedtime Stories fire. podcast. Trying to lie the way all their thumbnails just look like it was just nighttime, dude. Everything is black and white. I like that. Dog. Podcast, it is live Listen to them as you right go to sleep. Now. New episodes of the Bedtime Stories podcast will air each week on Wednesday, but right now the first three episodes of the podcast are available wherever you get your podcasts. So go and oh, no, mule kick the Bedtime Stories follow button right in the solar plexus and get hooked on them just like I did. But first, check out this clip from the trailer for Bedtime Stories. Hey! Turn off the lights, get into bed, and turn up the volume. It's time for a creepy bedtime story. From Ball and Studios, welcome to Bedtime Stories. A new <laughs> weekly show that will truly immerse you in a strange, dark and mysterious world and haunt your dreams. We'll bring you true stories from around the world, from the paranormal to the supernatural, unsolved mysteries, strange deaths, cryptids and the most disturbing of true crime all told in a unique and bone-chilling way. 
New episodes every Wednesday. I want to hear some of the stories. Follow Bedtime Stories wherever you get your podcasts. Bedtime I will stories. Leave. I will leave the links in my description as well. Bamboozled. On a sunny afternoon in October of 2015, a 39-year-old man named Richard Jones... After Let me go back in a year. On a sunny afternoon in October of 2015, a 39-year-old man named Richard Jones walked along the perimeter of the yard inside of the state prison in Kansas, where Richard was serving time for a robbery. Up ahead, Richard could see there was a small basketball court with one hoop on it, and on the blacktop were dozens of other inmates that were exercising and chatting and socializing, and Richard actually knew most of them because he had been in prison for 16 years now, and Richard was also a very likable guy who was very outgoing and personable, and so he made friends really easily, even in prison. And so as Richard continued his walk in the direction of the basketball court, he saw one of the guys on the blacktop broke free from the group and began moving towards Richard. And Richard immediately recognized who it was. It was his good friend, Steve. And Richard was about to give him a friendly wave when he noticed Steve looked really mad. And so Richard actually just stopped and stared at Steve as he slowly approached him. And as he got closer, Richard could see Steve's fists were balled up and his face was in a scowl. I mean, Steve looked like he was coming over to fight Richard. And so when Steve got about 10 feet away from Richard, Richard actually spoke up before Steve could say anything. And he said, Steve, what's going on? Why are you so upset? Steve was kind of a hothead and Richard knew that. But a lot of times, even when he got mad about things, it would blow over really quickly. And so this was kind of routine, but Richard just couldn't think of a reason for why Steve would be mad at him. And so Steve walks right up to Richard and he goes, oh, so now you wanna to talk to me? <clears throat> Richard was immediately confused and kind of turned his head sideways and was like, what? Steve stared at Richard, kind of expecting Richard to eventually apologize or something, but eventually he noticed that Richard really was not sure what he was talking about. And so Steve was like, this morning, I went up to you at the cafeteria line, I tried to talk to you, and you completely blew me off and walked away in front of a big group of people that really embarrassed me and made me look bad. And Richard was like... <laughs> the crazy part is, I know that conversation did not sound like that when it happened, but I understand. <laughs> at least he talked like, it out this with morning, you. This know? morning, I went up I to you at the cafeteria line, I tried to talk to you, and you completely blew me off and walked away in front of a big group of people that really embarrassed me and made me look bad. And Richard was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I didn't even see you this morning. I, I don't know where this is coming from. Steve was not buying it, and he was like, Richard, I know it was you. I saw you this morning. I spoke to you this morning. You did that. And Richard was like, no, really, Steve, I I'm sorry. I have no idea what this is about. And so these two continued to go back and forth, back and forth on this. And then at some point, they both kind of noticed that they were drawing lots of attention because they are in prison and any sort of confrontation immediately draws eyeballs. And so when they noticed other inmates were kind of beginning to walk over to see what was going on and the guards were starting to notice, Steve just said, you know what, Richard, fine. I guess I must have made a mistake. No big deal. And he turned and he ran back to the basketball court. After Steve had left, ah, Richard man, continued nigga, his walk around the perimeter. But that exchange with Steve had really weirded him out because this was actually not the first time something like this had happened. It all started a month ago when an inmate that Richard didn't know came up to him like he definitely knew him and said to Richard, you know, hey, how's your grandmother? I heard she fell down. You know, is she okay? And at first Richard was like, wait a minute, is my grandmother okay? Did she fall? But then Richard eventually realized that this inmate thought Richard was someone that he wasn't. Now, at first Richard thought this was just kind of like a weird one-off event, but every few days after this first time, something else would happen. Either an inmate who Richard didn't know would come up to him and be really friendly with him as if they knew Richard, but Richard clearly didn't know them, or someone Richard did know would come up to him and accuse him of odd behavior that Richard couldn't remember doing, like the interaction he had with Steve when Steve came up and said, you know, you snubbed me in the lunch line. And so after Richard's interaction, For real, for real. Not be funny, it just really fits. Sound like this nigga e either has an evil twin in jail or he's just blanking out. I got him evil of twin odd behavior that, that Richard about. couldn't remember doing, like the interaction he had with Steve when Steve came up and said, you know, you snubbed me in the lunch line. And so after Richard's interaction with Steve, Richard began to think, you know, wait a minute, is someone screwing with me? Is that what's been going on? 
The next morning during breakfast, Richard decided not to sit where he normally did, and instead he sat on the very far side in the corner of the cafeteria to basically just be able to people watch all the people inside the cafeteria. And then that afternoon, when Richard was outside, instead of walking around the perimeter like he liked to do, he just sat in a central location and just constantly scanned the whole yard. Now, Richard didn't really know what he was actually looking for. He just figured, you know, maybe I'll right. see something. I'm looking for me damn near. I feel like, man, they're trying to make me go crazy. And shit he working. just sat in a central location and just constantly scanned the whole yard. Now, Richard didn't really know what he was actually looking for. He just figured, you know, maybe I'll see something suspicious. I see, see my nose. I ain't gonna lie, boy. I'm looking for my shit. Oh, long head, ain't it? You seen a nigga look like a scream ass? You seen a nigga look like a scream ass? <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, this shit is wild, for. though, dude. He just for figured, real. you know, maybe I'll see something suspicious. I'll see someone staring at me for too long, or I'll see someone I don't know talking to my friends. You know, something will tip me off to what's been going on for the past couple of weeks. But despite all this careful people watching he was doing, Richard didn't see anything suspicious. Until one week after the interaction oh, Richard shit. had with Steve about snubbing him in the lunch line, Richard was sitting in the cafeteria again when he noticed something very strange on the other side of the cafeteria. And when he saw it, he just stood up and stared and he felt his heart starting to race faster and he felt his breath speeding up. And Steve actually was sitting next to him and said, hey, Richard, what's going on? And Richard couldn't even find the words. He just raised his arm up and pointed to the other side of the room. When Richard had originally been arrested 16 years earlier, it was for robbing someone in a Walmart parking lot. Richard had always claimed he did not do it, but multiple witnesses had pulled Richard oh, out of a lineup saying that's shit. the guy. And the woman who actually got robbed told police she overheard the getaway driver yelling to Rick, the man who had robbed her, to get in the car so they could leave. And Rick is a nickname for Richard. Richard had insisted he was at a barbecue in another state. I knew I fucked with Richard, even though he a bad guy. People make mistakes. I knew I fucked with Richard, dog. He seemed like a cool nigga. Man, get the f*** out of here, dog. Damn, you telling me someone looked just like me and committed a crime? They sound like a Beyond Belief episode, and I think we did watch a Beyond Belief episode on the stream recently, which is in the description, by the way, if you're not watching it. But regardless, dog, that's bullshit. Serving time for some shit I ain't do. Ah, I'm going to let it finish. I don't know where it's going. And the whole time, you can't even really be mad at the evil twin brother, neither, because he's like, shit, I ain't know you look like me out there. But let me see. This might Woman tangle a twist on robbed, told police she overheard the getaway driver yelling to Rick, the and his name is Richard. Robbed her yeah. to get in the car so they could leave. And Rick is a nickname for Richard. Richard had insisted he was at a barbecue in another state at the time of this robbery, and so it really couldn't have been him. But the evidence was just overwhelming, and so eventually he was convicted. Richard had never been able to understand why so many people 16 years earlier had insisted that he was the one who committed that crime. And more recently, he couldn't understand why his friends, like Steve, were accusing him of doing things that he didn't remember doing. But that night in the jail cafeteria, when Richard spotted something on the other side of the room, suddenly everything over the last 16 years made perfect sense. Richard really was an innocent man. He did not rob that woman in the Walmart parking lot. His doppelganger had. A doppelganger is someone who looks exactly like you but they're not actually related to you. It's just genetic chance that somebody else on the planet looks just like you. And it just so happened that Richard's doppelganger, who was this man named Ricky Amos, so it just so happened as well that the doppelganger shared basically the same first name, Ricky and Richard. Well, this doppelganger, Ricky, just happened to be sent to the same prison that Richard was at for a totally unrelated crime. These two men have never met. There's no connection whatsoever. Okay, they wait, 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 wait. Okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay, okay. He was in there the entire time, but then the one who looked like him, I take it he came in at one point. Ah, uh, I'm gonna let it finish. I'm gonna let it finish. I, I got the story. I'm a, I'm a little confused, but I but I got the I got the story. I got the story. Ah, uh, this shit hurt so much because I was thinking Richard got caught for something recently he did, and then he went to jail, but then at that moment these things started happening. No, he was in jail the 16 years for what the other dude did who looked like him committed the crime, who who robbed this woman, my bad, not a bank, who uh, robbed this woman. 
16 fucking years in there and legit didn't do it. It seriously hurt because you hear those sayings sometimes that people say, yeah, every, and it's like a sarcasm type of situation when they say it like, yeah, everyone in prison is innocent. Everyone didn't do it. And it's like, it hurt because it's like, I, I get it, people lie, but it sucks because you got the ones that's kind of mixed in, buried in, buried in there, where it's like, yo, really didn't do the shit. This one hurt like a mofo, dog. That's someone's freedom. That's like being dead for 16 years and then, oh, now we bring you back to life. I know that's not what's really happened, but it's kind of in that sense, man. Yeah, Doppelganger hurt, shared dog. basically the same first name, Ricky and Richard. Well, this doppelganger, Ricky, just happened to be sent to the same prison that Richard was at for a totally unrelated crime. These two men have never met. There's no connection whatsoever. They just look the same. And when Richard looked across the cafeteria and saw Ricky, it was like looking at a clone of himself and it all clicked. All the people that were coming up to him saying, you were doing this and acting weird. Well, those people, Stephen included, were actually interacting with his doppelganger, Ricky. And 16 years earlier, Ricky was the one who committed that robbery in mm. Walmart and the victim and the witnesses, they all confused Ricky for Richard. Here are Richard and Ricky's photographs side by side. God Once a damn. judge was made aware of- I'm not gonna lie, it's a little, no it ain't. <laughs> okay, maybe the ears a little bit, but you, normally ears on someone is something you, you have to look hard at to kind of notice, unless they have like big ears. Yo, the nose kind of got like somewhat almost kind of like the same bone structure a little bit. His mouth definitely got more of a slant, I can see it. But honestly, this just looks more of like on his end, it was just more of age on his end. That's the only thing that's showing the little difference, dog. Same style. Shit like this scared me, dog. I'm not going to lie to you because, hey, if I meet my doppelganger, I, I want to meet you. I want to know you. Evil or good, I want to know you. I don't care, dog. What the hell going on? Here are Richard and Ricky's photographs side by side. Once a judge was made aware of this situation and saw the two photos side by side, he knew the police had made a mistake. Even the prosecutor who had tried Richard in the robbery case supported his release. Richard was freed in 2017 I mean, and you, got man. a one million dollar settlement from mm. the state. As for the doppelganger, Ricky Amos, he was never actually. <sighs> I know it though. That time, boy, time cannot be bought. I understand it, but man, I definitely hope dogs take that million and i hope it's after tax too don't need, don't play him like that man and i shit hope you just strongly keep pushing and make more money made more money from it make made whatever make i'm saying make because he still got it to me he winning still that's fucked up man someone freed him dog. i went back again dog. even My the prosecutor bad. who had tried richard in the robbery case supported his release richard was freed in 2017 and got a one million dollar settlement from the state as for the doppelganger, Ricky Amos, he was never actually tried for the robbery 16 years earlier because by the time they figured out he was the robber, the case was too old to try. This credit card has an my doppelganger served my time. Shit, let's get to this one. It says suspended. Well, I'd have been there a hell of times in school. Texas had that weird shit. Or when I moved it, they had in school suspension. I was like, I ain't like that. I was like, that, that made too much sense <laughs> as an adult, I see. I ain't like that. <laughs> send me home. Nah, Flint, they used to send us home. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> no. Saturdays. On the right, evening of that. March 15th, 2018, a 55. about school. Oh, shit. All right, let's go. On the evening of March 15th, 2018, a 55 year old man named Gian stumbled out of this fine dining restaurant in downtown Singapore and promptly threw up on the sidewalk. Pedestrians jumped back to get out of the way and a woman in high heels and a beautiful fancy dress mumbled something insulting about how drunk Gian must be. But Gian was not drunk. He was totally sober and now he was absolutely mortified. John was actually a businessman who was attempting to impress his clients at dinner, but as he had been sitting at the table with his clients, he had started to feel this pressure in his chest that became so intense that at some point he just had to get up and run outside and vomit. And so after Jian had stood up and wiped his mouth, he thought, you know, now that he had been sick and thrown up, that he would feel better. 
But as he was standing there, he noticed the pressure in his chest had not been relieved at all. And so, as much as Gian wanted to stick around and talk more with his clients, he felt like the only thing he could do now was to go in and politely excuse himself for the rest of the night and just go home and sleep off whatever was going on with him. But when Gian went back into the restaurant and was actually back at his table, before he could even say a sentence to his clients explaining the situation, he was turning around and running back outside and vomiting on the street again. At this point, Gian knew something was definitely wrong, and so he didn't have time to tell his clients what was going on, he just needed to get to a hospital. And so he sprinted across the street, got in his car, and began driving. When he got to the hospital, he was so scared about what was happening to him that he actually parked his car crooked in the spot and left his door open as he sprinted towards the emergency Damn. room. And then once he was inside the hospital, he ran up to the receptionist and tried to tell them what was going on, but he literally couldn't speak. And then he just collapsed in a chair right nearby. Come now, on, the hospital man. was extremely busy, but all the nurses could tell whatever was going on with this man, it could not wait. And so they ran over to him, they lifted him up, they put him on a stretcher, and they wheeled him into a private exam room. And then once he was in there, they began taking his vitals, and also they began assessing him, looking for some sort of trauma on the outside of his body that could explain what was going on with him, but they couldn't find anything. And so after they were sure that Gian was stable, he was breathing okay, his heart rate was okay, he just couldn't speak, but you know, he was going to be okay, the team decided that the next thing they should do would be to give him a CT scan. A CT scan is a specialized type of imaging that can show what's going on inside someone's body. It's like a really detailed x-ray. And after they gave Gian a CT a scan, parasite. his results were baffling. There was this solid, fairly large, white object that was lodged at the base of Gian's esophagus. Your esophagus sits below your throat and above your stomach. It's basically the tube that food goes through to get to your stomach. But whatever was stuck inside of Gian's esophagus was not something that looked like food. It actually kind of looked like a human hand. Now, the doctors had no idea what this thing was, and you gotta remember that they really don't have much information here. All they know is this middle-aged guy who's dressed really well has come running into the hospital, he can't speak, and he's collapsed, and here we are. He has this obstruction in his esophagus. And so even though the doctors really had no idea what they were dealing with, what they knew is they had to get this foreign object out of Gian. So they wheeled Gian into the operating room for emergency surgery, and then at some point a doctor came in with this long skinny tube that had a camera at the top of it. Their first step for this operation was putting this camera down into Gian to see what this thing was that was stuck inside of his esophagus. And so after Gian was prepped for surgery, the doctor with this camera began snaking it down Gian's throat until finally the camera could actually see this white object in his esophagus. And when the camera revealed what this thing was, uh, the entire medical team in the operating room just gasped. My best on the stream. Remember what we were talking about when I was telling y'all, I was like, yo, I eat a lot of seafood. I, I love a lot of... I try a lot of different ish, but I told you, I remember I was like, I would not eat, I think it was squid or octopus, whatever, because I did hear, someone told me, man, and we talked about this already, lie, if you eat one of these and you do not, I think, I want to say do not chew it correctly, I don't know the proper way, you can cor correct me in the comment section, whatever, that mug will lodge itself or get, basically, glue. Grab yourself to your esophagus, your throw. Just kept trying to what throw this it thing up, man. was. The entire medical team in the operating room just gasped. They could not believe what they were looking at. To understand what they were looking at, we have to go back several hours. That night, Gian had decided he really wanted to impress his wealthy clients. And so he had decided to take them to this very special restaurant that none of them had been to. And he wanted them to try a very special and very rare dish See, that China this restaurant people. sold. It was called Sanakji. Sanakji. I ain't gonna lie, that's how my friend tasted it though, because we all dared him. We went out one time. Luckily, he chewed that motherfucker though. None of them had been to, and he wanted them to try a very special and very rare dish that this restaurant sold. It was called Sanakji. Sanakji is a Korean delicacy that is very popular in certain circles. 
but it's also very dangerous. Every year in South Korea, at least six people die from eating sanokji because sanokji is just a living octopus. You literally eat the octopus as it's moving around and the risk of it getting stuck in your throat is pretty high. And so as Pretty Jian hot. is trying to eat this living octopus, the octopus decided it didn't want to be eaten, and so it flailed its tentacles around, and finally its suckers lodged onto his esophagus, and that's where it stopped. Now, we don't know how long this octopus... Because if, if it went that way, which I could see it going that way, because like I said, going on with my, with my friends multiple times, that was the way it was eaten. Someone like, yo, who gonna do it, blah, say blah. They couldn't... Hit, the people he was trying to impress, blah, they couldn't tell. That's why he was throwing up. Like, yo, this nigga can't stop throwing up. It's probably that fucking octopus. Light bulb. I think it's the octopus. And so Doggy it mom. flailed its tentacles around, and finally its suckers lodged onto his esophagus, and that's where it stopped. Now, we don't know how long this octopus remained alive inside of Gian's esophagus, but we know it was alive at least for a little bit because after Jian managed to swallow it down, it kept wriggling around and grabbing and trying to escape. Oh. And that's what created that intense pressure in Jian's chest and kept causing him to go vomit. And so when the doctors put that camera down Jian's throat, they saw a whole octopus. The octopus was removed from Jian's esophagus. Good. And Thanks. two days later, Jian was discharged, fully recovered. It's Good. unclear if Jian ever tried Sanokchi again. He bet not. He better stop fucking with that shit. <laughs> At 4 a.m. on a winter day in 1993. <laughs> if it ain't been on 350, I eat it, dog. I eat raw sushi, I ain't gonna lie to you, but I don't eat like raw, raw. I'm not still alive, raw. At 4 a.m. on a winter day in <laughs> Nigga, I don't eat chicken, <laughs> beef, or nothing no more. <laughs> I ain't even eating fruit snacks if them bitches shaped like sea animals. <laughs> you get that shit out of here, doggy ball. Off a dog, some animal crackers. He gonna lose his shit. Dude, now it makes sense because I tell you all all the time, I'm a huge ASMR mukbang watcher. It makes sense why the ones who eat like the squid and octopus and everything, why they have like ridiculous, ridiculously crazy views. It'd be like in billions. You'd be like, God damn. At least I think it'd be billions. It'd be high though. I'd be like, man, no one. At 4 a.m. on a winter day in 1993, a 50-year-old man named Joe walked down a dark hallway inside of his farmhouse in Kentucky. As he moved, he did his best to be as quiet as possible so as not to wake up his wife or son who were sleeping nearby. But when Joe got about halfway down the hall, he happened to look inside the family room and he thought he saw something moving. He strained his eyes to see who it was, thinking maybe it was his wife or son who had gotten up for some reason, but he just couldn't tell. However, as Joe stared into the darkness, he heard the sound of floorboards creaking inside the family room, and then before Joe could do anything, the thing he had seen moving was now rushing straight towards him. Hours later, Kentucky State Police would arrive at Joe's house, and what they would discover there was a monstrous crime that literally had never been committed before in this part of Kentucky. Damn, I thought we was gonna get a ghost story. So that's gonna do it. If you got something out of today's stories. Well, damn, I thought Doggy Bone was gonna give one of those uh, bedtime horror story samples, whatever. But either way it go, man, that second story legit had my brain like, what the fuck? Because as it was sitting there, when I was like, I'm gonna say this out loud, and this is gonna sound so stupid. I was like, yeah, I'm getting the evil twin vibe, legit on some cartoon shit. But in the sense of a doppelganger, I ain't think of it in that way, man. This is crazy, man. Now, I'm not saying there's any truth behind what I'm about to say, but sometimes it definitely is easy easy to feel like someone is just watching one wild-ass fucking show or playing someone playing some crazy-ass game. A freaking doppelganger, man. You're telling me there's someone out there that legit, I'm wondering, that just look like me, skinny like me, dress like me, do the hairstyles, everything just like me. But what if I'm evil? But yeah, let me go ahead and get up out of here. Hey, I want to say be safe out here, but I don't even like that term no more. But as we hear, though, don't matter how you play it, life going to happen, dog. But shit, go ahead and keep moving forward. Go ahead and get to whatever you want, dog. You bone, but I'm out.